Well, this morning it's, it's our great pleasure to welcome um, a visitor of the house. He always inspires us. He has a word from God on his heart. So as we welcome Simon Ratray to the, to the uh, front, come down, Simon. I was actually going to prompt you to, to give him a warm flame tree welcome. But you beat me to it. I'm, I'm really interested to, um, to hear what Simon's got to say because the thing is I read a little bit of a blurb about him on Facebook and LinkedIn and Simon is here with his wife, so welcome. Um, he's a, obviously a husband a father, and he's known to be a fool for Christ. And I love that aspect in people. So welcome, Simon. Thanks, Tony. Well, it's great to be back, Flame Tree Church. Thanks for the warm welcome, and great to see so many faces, some that are familiar, some I have not seen before, but that's okay. And um, I'm used to long services. That's okay. So, providing you're used to long sermons, no, just kidding. Um, I remember uh, my first experience of an incredibly long service was uh, in a part of the Middle East some years ago, and they went on and on and on and on, and uh, I was thinking to myself, like, what's going on here? You know, it was like two hours, and they were praying for two hours. Uh, who, who can pray for two hours nonstop? Uh, they did it. And uh, it was astonishing because I'd never actually experienced this before. And so I was, you know, getting to the time when I was really, really hungry. It was like 2.30 p.m. I hadn't had lunch. The sermon had started at like 9 a.m. And uh, the sermon hadn't even started. And uh, I was actually informed that I was the preacher. <laughs> and the pastor just kind of miraculously out of the blue decided since I was there that I was going to preach. And uh, they said to me, if you finish in under two hours, people will get up. And I was like, what do you mean? They said, well, they'll actually be getting up telling you to keep going. <laughs> so uh, I hope we're all okay with that today. No, no, just, just kidding. If we have the first slide there, uh, this is a fascinating story. And I have my daughter, Emily. Emily, come up, love. She's going to read the passage for you. It's from John 8, 1 to 11. Uh, here's Emily. Get it? So I'm going to read John chapter 8, verse 1 to 11, A Woman Caught in Adultery. Jesus returned to the Mount of Olives, but early the next morning he was back again at the temple. A crowd soon gathered and he sat down and caught them, taught them. As he was speaking, the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery. They put her in front of the crowd. Teacher, they said to Jesus, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses says to stone her. What do you say? They were trying to trap him into saying something they could use against him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote in the dust with his finger. They kept demanding an answer. So he stood up again and said, All right, but let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. Then he, wrote, then he stooped down again and wrote in the dust. When the accusers heard this, they slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest, until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the woman. Then Jesus stood up again and said to the woman, Where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she said. And Jesus said, Neither do I. Go and sin no more. Thank you, Emily. It's a fascinating passage, and believe it or not, there was a time in the early church where John 8, 1 to 11 was... It wasn't included, and most of the early manuscripts of the Gospels don't include it, and it's strange that 
the vast majority of what they call Johannine scholars, that is scholars who study the Gospel of John, actually don't think it should be there. However, it exists in pretty well every Bible translation. Uh, if you can find a Bible translation that doesn't include this passage, you'll be quite surprised. And one of the reasons why the early church struggled with this passage so much because they were trying to find their identity in a time where sexual proclivity and divorce was common. It was even celebrated if you could do that successfully. And so the church was trying to find its identity as a, a moral fiber of truth and light where marriage and you know the love between a man and a woman was celebrated in marriage and a casual reading of this passage would suggest that Jesus was actually okay with what this woman had done he kind of let her get away with it yet when we see this incredible journey of Jesus love and grace and mercy we see something else unfold in the passage. And uh, to set the stage, I want to read a beautiful poem by a lady called Jennifer Marie. I was wrenched from my bed that was not my own to begin with. Into the sunlight they dragged me, hands yanked at my long hair. I clutched my body, jaw set. I silently vowed not to cry, just to take it like a woman should, to look them in the eye to stand unashamedly in front of my neighbours, my mother and my sisters, to stand in front of the town and face the inevitable. The Pharisees threw me to the ground, gave a swift kick to my side, gentle compared with what would come. A woman, eyes glossed with icy detest, spat in my face. So this woman, this wretched woman, this disease has been caught, they hissed. But I refused to give them the satisfaction. I wouldn't close my eyes during it. I couldn't. Jesus, they barked. We caught her sleeping with a man. Not her husband. You know what to do, Jesus. The little children and the rabbis and the mothers and the sons, they felt the ground for smooth, heavy rocks. I bowed my head slightly as fingers trembled over new prune-colored bruises on my ribs, my stomach. I unlocked my knees and lifted my chin. My eyes met with his, with his. He paused for a moment, nodded his head slowly. If you are without sin, please cast the first stone, he said. He wasn't looking at me. I bit my lip, waited, watched, squinting in the sunrise for what would happen next. In Catholic tradition, this woman was considered to be Mary Magdalene. And uh, you may be familiar with this picture. Does anyone know where it comes from? It comes from the movie The Passion of the Christ where uh, Monica Belushi plays Mary Magdalene and she actually was featured in this story because this is part of Catholic tradition. We don't really know who the woman was. Could have been Mary Magdalene, we don't, we don't really know. But this story is not just about the woman. This story is about all of us. And when Jesus uses a woman as an example of freedom, of opportunity, Jesus was setting the stage for what would actually change history. Did you know that the vast majority of your rights as women today actually come from these stories that Jesus told? So of course John eight. 1 to 11 should be in the passage of scripture. Do you agree? Yeah. Amen. Yeah. I remember told a story by a missionary some years ago when we were talking about this passage and he said what was so fascinating was that he was uh, writing uh, to a chieftain about the gospel in a particular culture in Southeast Asia where women were bought and sold. Actually, if you wanted a wife, you would buy them from their family. And the chieftain said to him, before I read this passage of the Bible, women were just considered a collective, you know, product. But when I read this passage, I started to see that men and women are created equal and actually women are to be treasured and he said it changed his whole perspective on how to lead his community 
And there are so many stories about John 8, 1 to 11 through history where people have actually been gripped by the power of God through these stories. Now, some of you might be asking, where was the bloke? That's a good one, isn't it? Or blokes. And, you know, what was Jesus writing on the ground? This has been a really, really difficult one for scholars, but I believe that I actually have cracked it. I know what Jesus wrote on the ground, and I'll share that with, with you a little bit later. But I, I wanted to remind you all that there was a time through history, not that much, not that very long ago in Western history, believe it or not, that women were actually in a very similar situation to this woman. Did you know that back only around about 200 years ago, women couldn't own land in England? Did you know that? So if your husband died and you didn't have an heir as a son, you could essentially lose everything. And the easiest way for you to find yourself climbing up the social ladder was to essentially become a mistress, basically a sophisticated prostitute. And this was very, very common in England. And um, I don't know if, you know, you've seen some of the movies. There's a movie called Rob Roy, which is exactly like, that's actually telling that kind of story. And I've experienced this complete and total, um, you know, degradation of woman, womanhood in different countries where I've been around the world. When I was in Malaysia for the first time, I met a young woman after a service, uh, and she might have been probably like 21, 22. She told me of a story when she was a little girl. She said that my parents desperately wanted a boy because if you don't have a son in our culture, well, it's, it's just you're not considered a family that's complete. You with me? And I had a twin sister, and my parents just doted on us. They loved us. They just gave everything to us, and we just felt so special. And there came a time when my mum got pregnant with a boy. And as soon as the little boy was born, it was kind of like we got forgotten. We couldn't afford much as a family, but what my parents could afford, they all gave to our younger brother. He went into school, yet we remained illiterate. And she said, when I was, I think she said, around about eight or nine, my father had promised me to take me to this special, um, you know, I guess you could say fun park. And I very rarely ever had anything special like an ice cream, but he promised me an ice cream. And he took me there and he dropped me where the ice creams were and never returned. He abandoned me. And it's very common in my culture. And she said, well, it was just expected that prostitution would be my only way of climbing up the social ladder. And she said, by the grace of God, one day somebody shared Christ with me and I became a Christian. And she ended up being an amazing worship leader and still is in that country. So the way that women are still treated around the world today is, is really quite unbelievable. Many of us are familiar with Masa Amini from Iran, who was beaten to death because she was wearing her hijab wrongly. And so this kind of treatment of women around the world is, is still as common today as it has ever been. And why are we so liberated in the West? It's not because of our technological revolution. It's actually came from Christianity, and it came from one of these stories. Probably even this story has had so much more influence than you could possibly imagine. You with me? But everywhere Jesus goes in the Gospels, he makes a habit of bringing women to the fore of the conversations. Many of you know that it was women who were actually working to supply the needs of Jesus and the disciples. As they walked through the countryside, as they, Jesus preached, as they did their ministry. And Jesus 
continued to make a habit of bringing liberation to women. I believe without a doubt that John 8, 1 to 11 is completely John uh, focus. It's a John written passage. Because if we go back a little bit further into John 4, there's another promiscuous woman who Jesus actually has to see. And remember in John 4, 4, it's one of the most beautiful verses in the entire Bible. It says that Jesus had to go to Samaria. He had to take the dangerous, it was a dangerous journey, it was a long journey, way out of his way, it wasn't planned, but Jesus had to go. Why did he have to go? Because there was a woman that he needed to see, so totally, totally uncultural, unheard of as a, as a leader, a religious leader, doing such a thing, but he has to go to see this woman, a woman who is so ostracized, so broken, so completely left without opportunity and recourse that she actually has to draw the life-giving source of her food and her consumption, which is water. She had to draw it in the dark, in the late afternoon or the early morning so that nobody could see her and mock her. And Jesus had to go to Samaria to see this woman. And uh, I took this picture of uh, one of the episodes um, of The Chosen. I hope I wasn't plagiarising anything, but <laughs> please don't tell uh, the people that actually developed this. When I was actually in the States, I got very close to meeting some of the people that developed this, this film. Anyway, we won't tell them about it, but I just love this picture. Look at the look on her face. She's like, me? You mean even I can be forgiven after all that I've ever, all I've done? She's not denying that she's done anything that Jesus said. This woman who is lying in the dirt about to be stoned is not denying that she is wrong. What Jesus is doing here is he is fulfilling his calling from Luke 4, which was what? He came to release the brokenhearted, to set the captives free, and to bring sight to the blind. Amen? And what he's doing is in a reversal, a brilliant reversal of an insight, Jesus is actually saying here, who are the ones who are blind? Who are the ones who need sight? It are those who do not understand grace. It's the Pharisees, it's the leaders of the law, and it's those who continue to become and remain judgmental. And uh, I just feel that there's so much this passage that can bring insight I really want to encourage you to spend some time in it later and look at it, read it through in a couple of different translations if you can. And ask the Lord, how, how are you guiding me into a confrontation with my own flesh and my own self and my own sense and often desire to judge those who I should not, those who I need to set free, those who I must touch and reach out to. The question is, was she caught in adultery? Probably. But that's not the point of the passage. Was she wrong? Yes, probably. I mean, there was no hidden cameras back then. I mean, you, you, you could get away with a lot back then. You can't these days when everyone's got TikTok and, you know, everyone's got a camera. You've got to be really, really careful what you do and what you say. But back then, we well, didn't have that. Was she in a brothel. Uh, the question is, well, who were the guys? Because back in Jesus' day, there was what they called the law of repudiation. And what that meant was is that as a wife, you could be divorced by your husband for not even cooking him what he wanted. Like he might have ordered steak and you cooked, you know, chicken tonight. <laughs> right? And seriously. And he, you could divorce your wife. 
on the witness of one other man. Women couldn't bring women as witnesses. Did you know that? And so if another man wouldn't actually be your witness, and it's not likely culturally that would be acceptable for you to try to find one who wasn't your husband, and your husband was taking you to court, you had actually no recourse. But is this the point of the passage? Is the point of the passage that she was a prostitute and that she committed adultery? Or is there a deeper point that Jesus is trying to make? At all levels of the conversation, Jesus is bringing each one of us down into the dirt. Each one of us to a place where we must acknowledge that we've been caught in sin and there's no way out except for the wonderful, magnificent love and mercy of Jesus and the cross of Christ. In Luke 14, Jesus confronts this idea that, you know, you can help a sick person on the Sabbath, not. Remember, the Pharisees said to Jesus, why are you healing on the Sabbath? It's, you can't do that. And Jesus is like, well, hang on a sec. You can't heal someone on the Sabbath, but you can get your donkey out of the well. That's okay. Uh, okay, fair enough. And so the hypocrisy just continues to flow and flow and flow. And we might ask ourselves, well, what did Jesus know about adultery anyway? Well, he knew a lot about adultery. I don't know if you've ever read the book of Hosea. Who's read Hosea? Uh, do a study on Hosea because... The imagery, the broken heart of God and the expression of disappointment, abandonment and sadness upon God's heart as he sees his people Israel that he continues to describe as being a harlot, as being a prostitute, prostituting themselves before evil gods, sacrificing their children. And it broke God's heart to the point that God with such incredible you know and almost unbelievable tactics he says to Hosea go and marry a prostitute because these this is how my people are treating me and as one scholar says this the Pharisees represented adulterous Israel who were the most adulterous of all nations it says that when it talks about Ahab in 1 Kings that Israel were the most adulterous of all nations. They continued it. They had some revivals, but they continued to break God's heart. And uh, the woman's sins were nowhere near the harlotry of Israel, caught in bed with other nations and now with Rome. Israel's leaders had continually compromised Israel's integrity by allowing foreign nations and now Rome to dictate much of their lives and culture. I'm going to stop here for a moment. I wasn't planning to say this. Obviously, I need to be careful what I say when I preach, especially when things are being recorded. But let me say this. As God's people, as the church in Australia, may we not be compromised by cultural values. May we not allow ourselves to be dominated by the values of the state or the values of those who essentially leverage the state to make decisions that are contrary to the will of God and God's word. And I'll not go any further with that one, but I'll ask the Holy Spirit to plant a seed of how he would want you to respond to that today. Amen? Because the Jewish leaders should have got on their knees and asked for forgiveness before God and said, God, we are sorry. We are sorry that we have led this adulterous nation. We continue to submit ourselves and bow the knee to Rome instead of bowing our knee to God. And this all started way back in 1 Samuel when the people insisted on having a king and it broke God's heart and God said to Samuel, let them go ahead, but this is going to be the result.
And if we go forward to the next chapter, which we don't have time to go to, but Jesus is actually within the Feast of Tabernacles. It's a long series of stories that are being told here by John. So what, they, what was he writing on the ground? He never wrote anything except for this piece. What was this piece? It's really, really interesting. It says in Jeremiah 17, 13, which Jesus actually quotes in John 7, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scriptures said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. Here is what Jeremiah wrote, that Jesus quoted, O oh Lord, the hope of Israel, all who abandon you will be put to shame. All who turn away from you will be written in the dust. For they have abandoned the Lord, the fountain of living water. The scribes, the Pharisees, the leaders of Israel, those who should have known better, had abandoned the stream of living water and their names were being written in the dust. Now this is uh, getting tougher now because for Jesus, imagine being him for a moment. Now, through all the history of Israel's prophecies about the Messiah, it was prophesied that he would be full of meekness and full of grace and full of mercy. And so all through Jesus' ministry so far, he'd shown people grace. He'd touched people. They were healed. He'd, you know, done incredible good deeds, right? And so the Pharisees were waiting for an opportunity to grab hold of Jesus and go, there you are. Look, you've broken the law. And... And Jesus is in a bit of a pickle, to use an old Aussie term. My mum used to say that when I was in trouble, I'd be in a pickle and Dad would have to come and pull me out. And so Jesus is in a bit of a pickle here because it was true. In the Mosaic law, if someone had committed adultery, they had to be stoned. That was in the law. And so Jesus' problem here is, is that, well, if he lets the woman get away with it and doesn't allow them to stone, stone the woman, well, he could be accused of breaking the Mosaic law, which, of course, he's already told them earlier on in John that he was part of scribing because he actually is God himself. So, essentially, he's going to lose all his credibility. Yet the other problem Jesus has is that he's actually found a lot of favour with the people because he's kind and compassionate and fulfilling the prophetic, the prophecies about the long-coming Messiah who is full of grace and mercy and truth. And so if he lets them stone the woman, he's going to lose credibility with the people and they're going to go, well, he's no longer gracious, he's no longer kind, maybe... Maybe he isn't God after all. Maybe he's been, he's been fooling us. And so Jesus is, is left with a hard choice. But wonderfully and beautifully, Jesus takes another tactic. He says... Those of you who are guiltless, sinless start. You come up and you take the first stone, you throw it at her. And gradually everyone starts to think, well, maybe, maybe we're just like her. We're not going to admit it, but we're just going to walk away. Maybe we're just like the woman, caught in sin with no way out. I met a pastor some years ago who, when I first walked into his office, I noticed a big stone in the distance on his shelf. <laughs> and uh, I, uh, I asked him, well, what's, what's that all about? And he said, well, remember the story of Jesus and the woman 
in adultery, he said, well, I should have received the first stone. You should have done. And the stone here is to remind me of the incredible grace of Christ. I deserved a stoning, but Jesus stood between me and the cosmic accuser of, of the world, Satan himself. Jesus stood between me and the wrath of God. Jesus stood between me and those who would seek to harm me. And Jesus forever lives to intercede before the throne of God for me because I continue by his grace to stumble and I continue by uh, his grace or I need his grace because I continue to stumble and I'm continually falling in the dirt every day. And so are you. All of us friends were once lying in the dirt with that woman caught in sin with no way out except for the gracious intervention of Jesus Christ. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, it's much easier to live in judgment than it is to live in grace. And I want to, as I start to wind this down and close, I want to ask each one of you to think about how you criticise, how you judge, in what ways do you do it? And I want to ask you to be accountable to your partner. I want to ask you to go and spend time with your children after this service and ask them, am I ever critical to you? Am I too critical? Am I judgmental? Where am I judgmental? How am I judgmental? And please forgive me and ask the Lord Jesus and your family to help you. Because we're critical by nature. I can be. It's one of the hardest and most excruciatingly difficult parts of the human flesh for us to overcome. It's so easy for us to act pharisaical and to act just like the leaders of the law who cannot seem to pull out the massive log in their own eye because they're so used to trying to pick out the little speck in someone else's life. I'm not at all suggesting that adultery is a speck, but I'm actually suggesting and in fact emphasising that the grace of God is an ocean and the love of God covers all sins. But I'm serious, I really want each one of us to take some time with our family later today or whenever you get the chance and ask them, am I critical? Do you feel sometimes like that woman? Do you feel like you're put down by me? Do you feel that my words are cutting? Do you feel that my words are judgmental? If they say yes, humble yourself before the Lord and say, Holy Spirit, help me. And so what do we do with this as people call out into the world to touch the untouchable, to love the unlovable. I want to suggest that it's hypocritical to accept the grace of God and not give it to others. And uh, if this is kind of the one-liner of the sermon, <laughs> let it be. I try to have a few there so, you know, we can have a few choices, you can take a few. But this is the one I'd like us in with. Are we, are we judgmental? Yes. We agree? Yeah. Too judgmental at times? Yeah. Are we all going to agree and go and spend some time with our loved ones and family and ask them? Yeah. Are we brave enough? Yeah. This means I'm going to have to ask Alice and Emily later, <laughs> which I will. I, of course, will, honey and honey. If we all acknowledge that every day, if not for the grace of God, that we have been caught in sin with no way out, it is only the grace of God flowing like an ever 
wonderful stream that can continue to cleanse us and heal us and restore us and the relationships around us. Amen. Here's a couple of practical ways that we can apply the message today. What I like so much is the message starts with Jesus going up to the Mount of Olives and praying. And he often would pray all night. So maybe spend some time in prayer and ask the Lord to show you how critical you are. Because I often kind of go, well, people say I can be a bit critical, but I'm like, yeah, it's not that bad. You know, I'm mucking around. I'm, uh, oh, you know, it's okay, but I'm sorry, but you with me? But we need to pray, we need to spend time asking the Lord to show us by his spirit to marinate our souls in his light and allow the darkness to be overcome by truth and wonder and you know, illumination of his truth and his word. Amen? Amen. Secondly, we see the Lord going into the places where these kinds of social issues occur. I mean, you're not going to see the brokenness of humanity in all its ugliness unless you actually go to the places where ugliness and evil breeds. You with me? Are we willing to go? As I have been sent, Jesus said, I send you. Ask the Lord to show you a broken place. A broken person today. That broken person might be you. When you finally acknowledge that you're a lot more judgmental than you actually think you are. And this is the last one. I love to share this one. Don't just address the social issues. Often in the Christian space, in our culture, we love to address social issues. This has become a massive uh, you know, industry in itself. We love to. We need to address the social issues, right? Jesus came to preach good news to the poor, not just the poor in spirit, right? But to the poor, physically poor, the those who are morally poor, but especially those who are actually downtrodden or actually having a difficult time in life. You know why? Because those who have nothing and those who have the least opportunity are usually the ones the most quickly respond to the gospel because they have nothing else. They have nobody else. You know, and they love the story about you are no longer orphans. So reach out and ask the Lord to show you how not to only deal with the social issues but to deal with the sin issues too. A friend of mine Joe Vandersee is a missionary some years ago in Morocco, and she wrote this beautiful poem. I want to finish with this. It's called Leaving Without Grace. We are leaving just like they did without grace when we fail to see small miracles take place. When we box the love of God into our invented space, when we imagine that there is not enough of grace for the ragged, tired and lonely, for the difficult and dirty, for the handicapped and homeless, for the masses and the multitudes that beg and cry for freedom from the devil's cold embrace. It's our job to touch this world one by one, day by day, with a touch that enters their space, with a look that then expresses all the love that's on Jesus' face. I imagine when that woman looked up and squinted into the sunlight, she would have seen looking down at her the most wonderful face in history. <laughs> he may not have been handsome. He may not have been anything to look at, but I imagine his face was so full of love and full of grace. So we never walk away and leave that woman, any woman or any body, without grace. Often when the New Testament writers placed a woman with Jesus, 
not only were they pointing out the vulnerability of women and how Jesus was liberating them, but a woman was basically a metaphor for the poor. So whenever we see a story about a woman in the Gospels, as women, be grateful and thankful because these are the stories that actually brought you the liberation and the freedoms that you have today or certainly influence that narrative. But also remember that Jesus is actually speaking about the most vulnerable and the most ostracized and often the most rejected and dehumanized people in society, those who are poor. So friends, I... Uh, Trust that today that you will leave here with a fresh revelation of grace. Let me pray for you. Loving Lord, uh, it's a privilege to come back to Flame Tree Church. It's a wonderful opportunity to share, Lord, with your people. Lord, help us to be people of love, people of grace. Lord, infuse within our souls a fresh revelation of your truth and your love. Lord, help us to be people that do not judge, but the people who always love. Lord, help me. Lord, help each one of us. Lord, help us to be honest about the areas of our lives that are judgmental, that are critical and that always seem to find a way to pull somebody down. And we struggle, Lord, with these emotions and these feelings, and we wonder why even as those who have been resurrected with Christ and sit with him in the heavenly places, that we still have these behaviors that haunt us. Help us, Lord, by your spirit to be honest about how, Lord, we need to change. You call us to love as you love, care as you care, seek justice, mercy and truth in a world that has yet to feel the warmth of your embrace, Lord. But we fail to heed your call. We draw back from those in need. We say nothing when we see injustice and we make excuses for compromise. Lord, show us those who are invisible. Forgive us, Lord, you who love you whose love is better than life, you whose grace extends to all, forgive us and enable us to be the people we could be that your name might be on the lips of all people and that they all may, wherever they are, each one who is caught in sin with no way out, see the reaching hand, Lord, the loving, looking down face of Jesus upon them, drawing, Lord, them out of the pit, Lord, out of the soil and helping them to stand. Lord, may each one of us leave this place with a fresh revelation of grace. Amen.